great. All right. Um, so I think we've covered introductions. Um, as I mentioned, I'm an RD. I'm going to explain kind of what that is if, if you don't know. Um, and I've had over 10 years of experience in the wellness and nutrition space. And so I, I wanted today, I think oftentimes in medical programs, healthcare programs, there's a, now a competency to discuss wellness uh, for students. However, I've always been really disappointed, <laughs> if I can be honest with you, in my discussions about wellness and um, the lectures that I've personally had as a student, um, I don't feel like they're really engaging enough and kind of uh, apropos to the times and what we face as modern healthcare students, pre-health students. Um, so I'm hoping that I can kind of give at least, um, you know, touch on that a little bit today. So I would love if you could all in the chat kind of explain to me what track you're currently on, um, you know, what type of pre-health student you are, because I know we've got a diverse audience today. Um, so that would be really helpful for me to know kind of um, who I'm speaking to. Do we have any pre-med students? Do we have any pre-PA students here? Um, I would love to see in the chat. Grad student, MSc, engaged medicine, awesome. Pre-nursing, wonderful. Thanks, Randy and Megan. Anybody else want to share what they're what they're currently on in terms of track? Otherwise, I will just keep going and, and feel free to, to chime in more as we go. So um, as I mentioned, you know, when you think of the word wellness, I think um, a lot of times it's this whitewashed, just kind of, uh, you know, sand yoga, like serenity, but um, nice three to two plus PA program. Awesome. So these are the photos that I kind of think we, or at least the media portrays with wellness, but what is wellness really? Wellness is more of a balance of the grit that we face, whether we're in a master's of science, whether we're in pre-nursing, whether we're in PA med school, um, it's going to look like a lot of grinding, a lot of studying. It might look like some weekends away where we're just letting loose entirely, or it might look like, <laughs> I put this here because because I wanted this to be a question of, is this a tear or is this sweat from working out? I know I shed a few tears in my PA program just because it gets to be a lot. But I think, you know, uh, being open and honest and authentic with our own emotions is a component of wellness that isn't talked about enough. So I'm hoping that today, in terms of objectives, we can kind of learn about what wellness really means, um, not just that whitewashed, pretty, you know, picture perfect idea, um, but really the fact that it encompasses eight dimensions. And also, I want us to really introspectively reflect and think what might be our current gaps in our own wellness routine. Are we even focusing on it at all? Um, and then understanding foundations of physical wellness, because those uh, kind of subdomains or subsets of wellness are the two, at least two that I can think of that I feel like I have the most credentials to speak on. So I'm not going to cover all eight dimensions in depth, but and then lastly, I want you to be able to take away today ways in which you can incorporate physical wellness into your unique routine as a pre-health student, whether you're a master's of science, PA nursing, whatever it may be. I, I know that everything that I share with you can be applicable to your life. So in terms of what wellness means, uh, there are eight dimensions, as I mentioned, and it, it su is supposed to be all encompassing of someone's life. Now, you might not, um, you know, focus personally on every domain. Uh, some you might, you know, for example, spiritual or religion, maybe that's not something you choose to spend time on. Um, financial, you know, might not be something you're focusing 100% on not not having uh, a full time salary, perhaps, but it is something to acknowledge. So I just wanted to briefly touch on what each uh, dimension of wellness is. So first being the emotional examples and what this really means is practicing gratitude, having that retrospective or introspective thinking, you know, thinking like, where did you come from and where are you today? That's what I meant by that retrospective thinking. I think we don't do that enough as healthcare students. It's all about that um, constant go, 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 that uh, innate desire to achieve the next thing. But I think it's important to really focus and reflect on the past. 
sharing thoughts and feelings with others, allowing vulnerability and taking time to quiet the mind, which is easier said than done. Um, spiritual, as I mentioned earlier, taking time to practice your faith or spirituality that you choose, maintaining connections to groups, maybe that's a youth group or a certain faith, um, and traveling to learn and expose yourself to other religions and spiritualities. The intellectual aspect is having patience with yourself as you accumulate rapid amounts of knowledge in one, one sitting. Um, when I was in PA school, I would have quite literally 500 slides from my anatomy course that I had to digest and kind of sift through. And it was just drinking from the fire hose. So being able to have that patience with oneself and understand that you're not meant to know it all and you're just a beginner is really, really important to maintaining that wellness. Physical, which I'm going to focus on most, is making time to move your body in enjoyable ways, eat the right things, and then prioritize sleep. <clears throat> Environmental wellness is taking time to unplug from tech daily, which again is also much easier said than done to do. Getting sunlight, I can't express the importance of vitamin D and connecting with nature, um, really touching grass, as, as the kids say these days, and just being mindful of resources that are um, non-renewable that we need to prioritize and take care of and be, um, you know, have a con conservation, conserv conservation mindset. Um, financial, you know, living within your means when you're a pre-health student, making a budget for yourself that, you know, allows for that flexibility and fun because what is wellness without that balance? Moving on to the last two, occupational, this will look like perhaps for you setting realistic goals for your future career and focusing on that work-life balance, not letting the ego get in the way. For example, for my for myself personally, um, what specialty did I want to pursue as a PA? You know, I really, really loved the adrenaline rush of my ER rotation. And my ego perhaps would have said, oh, yeah, those ER PAs, they make the big bucks, they save lives, they treat the acute patients. But was that really sustainable for me? And was that really going to give me the life that I wanted? Same goes for nursing, same goes for, you know, Masters of Science communities. Um, what is that career going to look like for you? And knowing to maintain an open mind too, that what you go into school with uh, in terms of career might change. And then lastly, your social life, making an effort to zoom out and keep in touch with family and um, supportive loved ones. Um, so again, I'm going to have us turn to the chat uh, to take a little bit of a brain break, but I'm curious to know in all of those domains, what areas of wellness do you feel like you currently struggle with the most? If you guys could share those, that would be really helpful for me. Occupational. Thanks, Janie. Yeah, I think that's important to know that we um, we struggle with that work-life work balance, um, not only in pre-health, but in our careers as well. Brooke, Randy, or Megan, can any of you guys chime in? Timing of meal prep, planning, working out, having time to relax. Thank you for sharing that, Megan. Yeah, we're going to talk about, about that. Environmental. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Work-life balance. I love it. Thank you. All right. And then perhaps maybe the same question, but I'm asking the same question in just a slightly different light. And this applies more to the pre-health students. But do you think that the areas of wellness that you might struggle with will be the same when you start working? Or do you think those might change? What are your thoughts there? Definitely the emotional aspect of healthcare is huge and knowing when you can decompress is, and not taking your work home with you. Thank you for saying that. That's so important. So again, finding that specialty area of medicine or healthcare that you can most, most definitely and most comfortably do that might be important for you. Mental. Yes. Perfect. Thank you guys all for, for chiming in. So I think it's important no matter what stage of the game you're at to check your emotional temperature and um, really assessing where you stand with your personal wellness at every stage of your training is so, so important. 
So as I mentioned earlier, as a dietitian turned physician assistant, I feel like I have um, the most qualifications to focus on the physical aspect, um, not discounting any of the others, but um, this is what this talk is going to focus on. And hopefully I can help give you some good tips and, uh, and we can dive in from there. But before we begin in our deep dive of physical wellness, I want you to remember this statement. The wellness industry is currently worth $5.6 trillion, and you'll notice this big fat asterisk I put up there. Most of this money is profited off of insecurities. If you really look at ads within the mental or excuse me, the, the wellness space, um, a lot of it really calls down to the fact that there's something wrong with you, but, but in all actuality, there isn't. Um, for example, detox teas or things of that nature. We have a detox system in our body. It's the liver. As long as you have a working liver, you're just a okay. So just kind of, as we enter this discussion of wellness, I really want us to focus on this glaring fact that the wellness industry is pretty wacky and there's a lot of money made. And I feel like um, I'm very, very present and uh, you know active on social media. So I see a lot of this. And as a healthcare professional, I'm trying to combat misinformation on a daily basis. And I feel like influencers, for better or for worse, they're here. And they can sometimes muddy the waters when they share information that might not be scientifically founded or based. Um, so I want you to think about your latest scroll on social media. Have you seen someone promoting something or using anecdotal evidence as truth. I think that is something I personally see all the time. And really what's problematic about that and with the wellness industry in general is that we're forgetting and our MSC here can attest to the good old adage that correlation does not equal causation. And um, this is something that is done way too often in our uh, promotion of either supplements or um, even wellness apps or things like that, like um, Noom, for example, um, is kind of the latest diet trend. Um, I, I may uh, be forgetting others, but using fear mongering statements is also something if you pull out your microscope or your, your magnifying glass that you'll see often um, using the it worked for me statement as evidence um, like, oh, this worked for me. Well, so it's going to work for Grandpa Randy, too, um, <clears throat> for being reason why someone should buy a product. Cherry picking data in uh, studies to meet a certain agenda, or this is my big biggest pet peeve, applying rat data or mice data to human subjects. Um, you'll see this so, so often. And um, maybe Megan, if you are, you know, honed in and keyed into uh, wellness influencers and things, maybe as a, a, you know, master's in science, you can also see this. Um, but this is something that just grinds my gears. And then again, using marketing terms like detoxing or hormone balancing is one that I'm seeing a lot now that just is really, really quite, I'll, I'll go so far as to say the word toxic language, um, because hormone balancing, what does that even mean? What hormones are you talking about? So I could get off my soapbox now, but, um, when it comes to physical wellness, thinking about firstly our nutrition, um, we have to be sustainable and there is no quick fix. And I know that that's sometimes hard to hear, uh, but I wanted to share the three nutrition mantras that I personally live by. And those are first and foremost to aim for what I call the power three. And those are going to be carbs, protein, and color. So carbs are quite literally the fuel and energy that our body and brain require to function at our optimal best. Protein is important for so many things, um, but it's really going to be such a great, great tool for maintaining our weight and having that good energy. Um, if I don't eat adequate protein, I feel sluggish. My mood is off. There's, and, and I, I know I'm using an anecdotal, um, statement with that, but, but we've seen in the research how important protein is. 
And then the color piece is something that I just use to kind of encapsulate fruits, vegetables, because those are where things like fiber come in. So fiber um, is a nutrient of concern for Americans. Uh, both men and women are not reaching their goals. 25 grams for women, 30 for men each day. It's extremely hard to maintain that, but that's going to be important for so many things like maintaining optimal balance of um, gut bacteria, maintaining cholesterol levels, and really just allowing our bodies to stay fuller longer. When we incorporate things like fiber, um, whether that's from whole grains, fruits, or vegetables, um, it really levels out our blood sugars and just maintains that satiety factor, which is so important for a student because when you're studying all day, you can't afford to have to, you know, go and make meals every, every few hours. The second mantra I live by is what can be added to the meal instead of taken away. <clears throat> As a dietitian, I never like it when we're being called the food police or when we have a restrictive mindset with food. Um, instead, you know, thinking what can you add to your pizza on the weekend? Can you add a little side salad or a half cup of vegetables or fruit on the side? What can be added to maybe hit those three power three? And then number three, of course, eating things that you actually enjoy. For me, that's dessert every night. <laughs> Even if it's just a bite of chocolate, I have to have it. And I know that if I allow myself to have that, I'm not going to binge or overdo it um, if I have that restrictive mindset. So because um, this is actually uh, an image prior, this is the Canadian um, my plate version. So um, the food pyramid has been discontinued years ago um, and the United States has what's called the my plate. Um, and this is optimal nutrition for the average American person. So a quarter of our plate being from protein, a quarter from whole grains, and then half the plate being fruits and vegetables. The one thing that is different from the Canadian version versus the USA is that their drink of choice in Canada is water and in the United States, it's milk. So, you know, <clears throat> calcium is important, especially for certain people with uh, certain chronic conditions, but I think water is great. And uh, that's why I chose this image here. But that's super pretty, and I don't want to make you feel like nutrition has to be super aesthetic and pretty and Instagram and TikTok worthy. So I wanted to show some real life examples. These are um, as an RD, I take food eat the the um, the phone eats first, so I always take pictures of my food. But this was a, a breakfast I made during PA school. Um, oatmeal is something I live by because it's cheap. It's a source of soluble fiber. It keeps me full through the entire morning, and it's very portable. So for our nurses who are student nurses, you need something quick. You can pack that in a Tupperware, and then eggs are easy. I just actually scramble my eggs in the microwave. Don't judge me. Um, <clears throat> And then here, a snack of Greek yogurt, which is super high in protein, um, whole grain with chia seed uh, oatmeal that you can either buy or make, super cheap if you make it at home, with fresh berries that I kind of splurged on. Um, and then uh, I was able to find uh, pre-made pre salmon. Um, I love pre-made meals uh, because sometimes cooking is not something we have time for as students. Um, on a bed of, um, I think this is either quinoa or orzo pasta. All right. <clears throat> so as a pre-health student, prioritizing good nutrition is so important. I know somebody earlier, I think it was Megan, you said timing of meal prep, working out and, and having time to relax. Um, these are some tips that I think if you can really, really um, ace, you're going to be so, so um, ahead of the game and ahead of your peers. The first is focusing on consistently hitting the basics, like I mentioned aiming for the power three at meals, taking some time to evaluate your own relationship with food and remembering that there are no bad foods and food doesn't hold moral value. So if you did have a night where you just went out and got fast food, you know, not being guilty for yourself, that's something um, both men and women are, are I think, guilty of and experiencing research. I just saw an article showing that men are uh, uh, dealing with eating disorders a lot earlier than we realized too. 
um, learning to be flexible and how to make nutritious choices on the go. This was personally huge for me when I was on clinical rotations as a PA student. Um, oftentimes you have to go to rural areas where you're going to be away from the comforts of your own home. So I relied on little grocery stores, gas stations sometimes were the only grocery stores I had. And so knowing how to make nutritious choices at those locations is really important to maintaining good nutrition and health. And then get in the habit of meal prepping. I know it's hard. It's really tough. Um, but if you can just carve like even 30 minutes on a Sunday night, you're going to set up your entire week um, and it's going to be worth the, worth your while. And then teaming up, you know, if you live with a roommate or if you have friends, I sometimes will um, kind of con divide and conquer with meal prep with a friend. So um, we'll split tasks, we'll do grocery shopping together, or we'll cook together and we could like batch prepare soups or something and then split what we make and share it. Kind of a fun idea. So I want you to think about the nutrition traps that I see time and time again, both my patients and friends doing. Um, I'm even guilty of a lot of these too in the past and sometimes currently. Um, the first is skipping meals. So <clears throat> whether or not you are on your surgery rotation <laughs> and you see the first cut and you pass out, we don't want that to happen. Um, you're going to be more likely to do that if you skip a meal. Or if you're writing your thesis or taking an, an exam, you want to have that glucose to your brain and fuel fuel your body in more ways than one. So skipping meals is just set up for self sabotage. Um, so again, you know, you've got a pharmacology exam coming up, you forget to eat because you're for, so focused on studying. Or this is something I know I'm guilty of I'm working in the hospital, you have coffee for lunch. Coffee is not a meal. Please remember that. that that doesn't count, even though it does curb your appetite and keeps you going that much longer. It just doesn't set you up for good nutrition. The second trap is ignoring your body, knowing that the gut brain connection, um, your gut and your brain are connected via the vagal nerve, uh, vagus nerve. If, if one is off, if your brain's off, your gut's going to be off and vice versa. Um, so if you're really stressed, your stomach's more likely to be affected. Certain foods um, for some, certain people work better for some. So trying to be mindful of what literally works for you is also important. <clears throat> And then something I kind of alluded to earlier, this deprived binge cycle is something I see so, so commonly. Um, so point of view, you really crave a food that you tell yourself is off limits. Um, for me, that's like banana bread or cake or something super, super sweet and carby. Um, and you ignore that craving all day until you finally give in and binge on that food at night. Um, that I think we're all, all guilty of doing that at some point in our life, what, whatever type of food that is for you. So knowing that those are some of the most common nutrition traps that I think are most relevant to you as a student, um, I want us to, again, go back to basics and remember to try to eat three meals a day. I know it sounds so simple, but it's really not. Um, it's a lot easier said than done sometimes when you're busy to eat three meals. And then trying to keep, um, excuse me for this typo, I, I missed within, trying to keep the fab three, that power three, carbs, protein, and color um, in within an hour of waking up if you can. And then if you notice you're hungry, you know, go for more, allow yourself that permission. I want you to start thinking about the way that you eat when we eat. Um, how many of us are guilty, myself included, for scrolling social media while we're eating lunch or checking emails or texting someone when we're eating? Um, are you distracted when you're eating? Are you stressed or are you rushed? Um, I'm a 90s kid growing up um, in school. I only had about 20 minutes to eat lunch like throughout the entirety of my schooling. And as a result now in my 30s, I'm very rushed to eat. Um, so I think really focusing on slowing down taking up that full 30 minute lunch hour time frame that you have is important. And then this sounds super weird, but chewing your food and aiming to take the full, I already mentioned this, the full 30 minutes. So really chewing your food um, so that it allows it to digest better does wonders for um, somebody with IBS or something like that. 
Um, lastly, um, I think it's so important to shift our mindset with nutrition and trying not to be black or white and taking this all or nothing approach. Um, I really encourage you not to try to jump on every fad diet trend and remembering that what, what works for you might not for another and vice versa. So I'm not sure if people in the um, webinar tonight know what a registered dietitian is or does, um, but it's something that could potentially, if you find yourself struggling with nutrition, uh, could be helpful for you um, and definitely for your future patients. So registered dietitians like myself, RDNs, can be consulted and utilized in any setting within a hospital or clinic. Um, they're a member of the interdisciplinary healthcare team, and we manage a lot of different conditions. So example role Goals. Um, we do diabetes education, of course, nutrition for pregnancy, right? Because um, they're very, very important micronutrients of concern for pregnant women. Uh, we do pediatric nutrition, which is what my career has consisted of. So things like managing a baby's formula intake or their amounts of breast milk for optimal growth. We do transplant nutrition education. Um, people post-transplant are extremely immunosuppressed. And so there are certain types of foods that you have to avoid that a diet Dietitian educates on. Um, we manage tube feeding or parenteral nutri nutrition. So when a patient has um, a pathology that prevents them from being able to eat by mouth, we have to give nutrition from other means, and that's the job of the RD. We work in sports nutrition, school settings. Um, we do diets for seizure, seizure prevention. Perhaps some of you know that the ketogenic diet was actually originated to prevent seizures. Um, so lots of things, um, including eating disorder treatment. All right, so we can't, I'd be remiss if I didn't focus on other components of physical wellness and the next is activity and rest. Um, for me personally, physical wellness, I'm not a personal trainer or anything, um, though I do enjoy working out. I find this to be the hardest to stay on top of um, when I was both a student and now as a practicing provider, but it's so, so important. Something that helps me uh, kind of stay on track is if I remember the connection that research has shown um, between maintaining that good physical activity and emotion and stress reduction. So <clears throat> this is a review article, but this shows that um, our physical activity really uh not only leads to a reduction in cortisol levels, but it helps restore balance of leptin and ghrelin, which are hunger hormones in our body. And so knowing that this cascade happens from just uh, working out and being physically active is so, so powerful. And then we've all heard that exercise gives you endorphins, exercise makes you happy, you know, Legally Blonde movie. Um, this is actually a graphical representation of why that happens. So when we exercise regularly, the uh, pituitary gland is involved, right? It helps increase endorphins. Um, it helps uh kind of secrete and endogenous opioid peptides. So opioids meaning things that make us feel good. And those in turn reduce anxiety symptoms and depressive symptoms. And pooled research worldwide has shown that physical exercise is more effective than a control group and obviously a viable remedy for depression which is definitely something that unfortunately too many medical students, healthcare professionals struggle with. So, um, you know, we all know that physical activity is so, so important, whether it's cardiovascular exercise or weight training or flexibility, uh, balance, things like that. But it, what I, again, hopefully what I uh, showed in the nutrition component of this talk is that you've got to find something that you enjoy because if you don't, it won't be sustainable for the long term. I put the current guidelines up here just because I think it's important to kind of get a frame of reference of what is um, out there in terms of the studied research for optimal health. And that is for adults getting a recommendation of 150 minutes every week of moderate intensity aerobic activity plus weight training. Or if you wanted to bump it up a notch and maybe do a HIIT workout, you could bump that time down a bit and um, only do 75 minutes. Know that this is cumulative. It doesn't have to happen all in one sitting and you can spread it out throughout the week and it still counts. And you can also do an equivalent mix of both. You'll notice though that strength training via weights is, is in there um, for all of them. 
So some exercise tips um, that I can give just from somebody who kind of failed at exercising uh, regularly during PA school uh, are first to schedule it in um, and then maximizing what you have. And then I'll talk about exercise snacks. But I had a friend, a colleague in PA school who I really, really admire. Um, and he made this the, the topic of exercise for him. He was a runner he made it a non-negotiable during school. And um, I didn't, and I really regret that. I didn't have enough self-discipline to make it that non-negotiable. But what he did was no matter what the test was the next day, no matter what he had on his agenda, he would schedule it in for 30 minutes at least of you know pretty strenuous activity. And like I said, non-negotiable, he'd do it every single night. Um, and remembering that a little bit is better than nothing. Sometimes I personally struggle with the thought that, well, if I don't sweat a bunch or if I don't put in like an hour, then I might as well just not do anything at all. That's something I struggle with, but I know it's wrong. I'm going to skip over to maximizing what you have. Um, you probably, I don't know where you live, if it's an apartment complex or a home, but you know, there's got to be fitness equipment somewhere at your disposal, whether it's an exercise band, soup cans, whatever, um, or if you're in an apartment, you know, maybe you have a gym facility. Um, hospitals also have gyms. So asking questions, how do you get access to that either when you're on rotations um, or, you know, if you're an employee. <clears throat> And then something that I think we don't think about enough is if you are on an insurance plan, sometimes, not all, because they're not all created equal, but some insurance plans give um, like sweat equity benefits where they give you a certain dollar value to reimburse you for gym. So something to keep in mind and not forget. The term exercise snacks is actually something that has been studied in research recently. And um, I think it's a funny word, but that is what it says in the papers. Uh, this exercise snack is defined as less than one minute bouts of vigorous activity spread throughout the day. And small concept studies have proven uh, that it leads to improved cardiorespiratory benefit and offsets detrimental effects of sedentary activity. So Things like exercise snacks would be like little squats in your uh, office or taking the stairs or, you know, maybe doing push ups against the wall or even on the ground if you're feeling uh, really, really uh, uh, like you're a go getter that day. So exercise snacks, I think, are important for those of us who are working full time um, or who are in the study didactic mode of your program. All right. And uh, <clears throat> I would be completely remiss if we didn't focus on sleep as a component of mental wellness. So I've taken you from nutrition to physical activity and now kind of <laughs> focusing on rounding out with sleep. And it's generally recognized that students of all ages and levels, whether you're a master's of science student, nursing student, pre-PA, we students just don't get adequate levels of sleep. And um, the studies show that sleep is one of the most important things that we can do for longevity, health promotion, things of that nature. One cross-sectional study focusing on just medical students. I know not, not any of you tonight are med students, but you know we can kind of take, take some things from the study showed that over 75% of those students identified as poor sleepers and a third of them sleep less than the recommended amount, which is um, about seven to nine hours a night. Um, something I found really interesting with this study too, and it's been uh, replicated and repeated many times, is that um, people who are, who do consider themselves to be poor sleepers also have lower GPAs. So, I know that when we're in professional programs like PA school or masters, you know, GPAs might not matter as much as if we're in our undergrad program, but it is something to just take with a grain of salt. You're going to perform better if you sleep optimally. So thinking about sleep and how to get it, because uh, this is also something I struggled with, and it might be something you struggle with too if you work night shifts or if you're rotating on night shifts, is sleep hygiene. And there are four pillars of good sleep hygiene. Um, and the first is regularity. So how often are we getting the recommended amount of sleep throughout a week, throughout a month, a year, what, what have you? And the way that we get 
regular regularity with our sleep is trying to stick to a similar schedule. Um, that means, you know, waking up at the same times, even on weekends, trying to go to bed at the same times, even on weekends. Um, the problem with this and something I mentioned earlier is that there might be times in your career where you have to flip flop between day and night shift. And that kind of throws off your circadian rhythm. Um, <clears throat> so in those instances, or, you know, maybe you're a parent and you have a child waking you up in the middle of the night frequently, um, you're going to have to try to rely on the other three pillars if that is um, your your instance. And let's see, who was your, our pre, Brooke is your pre-PA student. Um, some of my, you'll be interested to know, some of my colleagues, I did not have to work a night shift in clinical rotations, but some of my colleagues in school did. So just keeping that in mind that it's so, so important to get that worked out. The next pillar is continuity. So how how often are we able to sleep through the night is what that means. <clears throat> Things to think about for uh, maintaining continuity of sleep is first and foremost, avoiding sleep disruptors. So those are things like too much caffeine, especially late in the day, um, trying to avoid alcohol late at night, which for some people makes them get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. Um, <clears throat> I put in parentheses here, naps. <laughs> I was a big nap taker in PA school, like whether it was a cat nap or a power nap, that does really throw off your sleep cycle and schedule. And then cell phone, um, that light uh, that you visualize, you know, as you're trying to maintain a dark space just really throws you off. Something that I personally, um, and this is not a sponsorship or anything, um, I love uh, the Calm app because I love using uh, sounds and sleep machines, like noise machines at night to help me get to sleep. So that's just something to, to perhaps help you out. The third pillar of sleep hygiene is quantity. So again, sleep societies recommend that seven to nine hours, but everybody's different. Um, I don't know if this is scientifically proven or not, but I feel like women need more sleep than men. Um, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, just knowing that that differs. Um, but I just wanna really, really, really um, underscore the fact that I promise you that all-nighters are never gonna be worth it. <laughs> no matter how important you think that quiz or test is or that A is, um, it's just never worth taking an all-nighter for. And then lastly, and not least, is quality of your sleep. Um, this refers to how well you're sleeping and if you wake up feeling refreshed the next day on a consistent basis. And um, factors that obviously affect this are going to be things like location. You know, when you're on rotations, you're going to be sleeping in hotel rooms that might throw you off a little bit. The temperature of your room. Um, some people um, don't realize that sleeping at a cooler temperature actually does help us sleep better. And then that presence or absence of light. So again, for our night shifters, really trying to get those blackout curtains if you can is going to be so, so important. So in a nutshell, that is sleep. And um, I hope that with that, we've rounded out all aspects of physical wellness and we've kind of um, really, really taken a deep dive in not only the nutrition piece, the physical activity piece, um, but then the sleep piece. And that I hope that you feel inspired now to think more consistently about incorporating wellness into your routine, especially those nutrition things. Um, so I want to thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, I wanted to make this talk short and sweet and to the point. Um, I am more than happy to take any questions or comments uh, so that we can kind of get a conversation going. I absolutely love chatting about this subject, as you can hopefully can see. Um, so if anybody has any thoughts, put it in the chat right now. Thank you so much, Caroline. I know <clears throat> not quite in the medical school, but I've learned certainly a lot. I do work in healthcare and it's always such a challenge trying to balance the wellness piece. Um, while we're waiting for our audience to put some questions in the chat, please feel free. I do have one question and you've talked about the meal prepping and sort of writing things down, making sure you have things scheduled. But I'm curious, what other ways were you able to keep yourself accountable, especially in terms of finding a community of friends mm -hmm. that you may be studying or going to school with to make sure that some of your wellness goals, you accomplish them throughout um, your schooling and your career? That is such a great question. In terms of the nutrition piece, um, you know, I, I, 
I'll be honest and transparent. I personally um, in college have dealt with some uh, disordered eating patterns personally. Um, and that's something I'm very confident that I've gotten over. And that's why maybe you kind of saw um, me talk about that eating disorder, that, you know, relationship with food component a little bit more than um, some others might focus on in a wellness talk. So um, because of that past I don't like to write down what I eat or track calories or anything like that. Um, for me, that is a, a, a habit that just um, provokes more anxiety for me. Um, so definitely don't don't get accountable. Uh, uh, don't have an accountability factor from that aspect for myself. Um, <clears throat> I think over the years of being a nutrition professional, I've really been able to kind of check my emotional temperature and self-regulate and really check in with myself, um, my hunger levels, my own personal hunger scale, and um, my feelings of, you know, uh, feeling fresh or not. So I constantly check in with my own self. And I know that if I'm feeling kind of sluggish, it most likely had to do with something that I didn't do in the kitchen. Um, so that I think learn to really listen to our own bodies is important. In terms of the accountability piece with friends, um, I often did study with friends and would take time to just decompress over lunch, not try to feel like I had to study or, you know, get notes in during the lunch hour, but really just focus on conversation with friends. So that was my time of wellness in my PA program. Um, additionally, on uh, rotations, when we were all dispersed throughout the country, actually, we tried to have a Zoom meeting. My, my my little friend group who I studied with um, to kind of check in and um, discuss each other's uh, events and struggles and wins and things like that. So I don't know if that answers your question. I think it's a, a really tough question to answer and just a, a little blurb, but um, finding that that tribe and that group of people you you feel can open up to and kind of be your vulnerable self with is really important. And then, you know, if you want to find a gym buddy or an accountability buddy to meal prep with, hey, the more the merrier. So that's kind of my my two cents on that. Thank you. Yes, of course. Um, next question I'm going to take is Megan. So in terms of your work as an RDN, did you have to deal with supporting patients post antibiotic use such as H. pylori infections? Um, that is super interesting. At the time when I was uh, practicing as a dietitian, uh, the research uh, was in favor of probiotic use. Um, research now actually shows that probiotics really don't do as much uh, good as we thought, um, especially for our NICU patients or neonatal pediatric patients. They're actually really, really harmful. Um, so maybe, you know, five years ago, I was doing more with per, uh, recommending because uh, RDs can't necessarily prescribe, but we can give recommendations for probiotics probiotics. Um, but I would always try to take a food first approach to sort of reseed the gut with that good um, bacteria. And that's done through fibrous foods. Um, the bacteria in our food are um, ferment on uh, and really eat uh, prebiotics. And those prebiotic foods are those fiber foods. So <clears throat> I can't think of any patients with H. pylori that I um, worked with directly like in memory. Um, but, but definitely that would be something that an RD could, could assist with. Randy asks, how did you balance your sleep schedule during PA school? So <clears throat> I mentioned my friend, his name's Jackson. I feel comfortable saying that. Um, he was the runner who did such a good job at making uh, exercise a non-negotiable. For me, my non-negotiable was sleep. And it always has been. And so I might not be, Randy, the best person to ask that. Um, but I call myself a grandma. I go to bed um, pretty early, like 9, 10, every single night. And I I try to wake up around the same time every day. So for me, that's just my non-negotiable. I've never in my life pulled an all-nighter. Pretty proud of saying that. Um, it's just something that's so important for me. And if I don't get enough sleep personally, I'm just dead the next day. I'm just not a functioning human being. So um, it's, it's really tough if that's not the way you are, maybe you are used to kind of having that awkward sleep schedule cycle, um, but focusing, remembering those pillars of sleep hygiene and maybe just deciding to focus on one for a month and knowing that it's not going to be a quick fix. It takes a long time to kind of reset if, if sleeping is, is struggle a struggle for you. Um, 
Obviously, there are also medications, too, that you can talk to your provider about if you really, really are at that point of needing help, say you have insomnia or something. Um, but I think for most people, um, a lot of people who are actually on sleep medications, too, don't actually focus on all the four uh, pillars of sleep hygiene. And if they did, they you know potentially could not even need the medication. The next question is, what is your take on using watches or phones to put in reminders to take breaks and have snacks, not necessarily to be stringent with calories? I love that idea. Um, you know, perhaps you are the type of person that when you're studying and you're in the zone and you're really, really focused, you completely forget to eat. <laughs> I, that's actually not very uncommon. Um, so if that is you, and if you identify like that, then I highly recommend, yeah, just like your iPhone gives you like the stand up um, little nudges, you might want to do that for snacks. Um, if eating and, you know, maintaining that good, uh, consistent three meals, snacks a day is a problem for you. I love that. How do you approach busting myths about nutritional or vitamin supplements with your patients? Um, <clears throat> great question. I try to do it on social media. I try to just um, sh share, obviously, evidence-based research. Um, and I just try to show the gaps in the research. So this is where really understanding how to kind of nitpick apart research studies is important. And I think using the causation does not equal correlation is probably the best catch-all phrase you can tell your patients. Um, nutritional studies are extremely difficult to, um, to run. Uh, it's really hard um, for either ethical reasons, what have you, but a lot of nutrition is gray. And so understanding that you just can't have that anecdotal approach to nutrition, you know, what worked for Sally is not going to work for Joe. It just, it just doesn't work like that. So that's the best um, answer I can give to that, I suppose. Brooke asks, how did you manage um, making time to stay connected to family and friends when in PA school? Really tough question to answer. Um, I probably wasn't the best at it, but having, you know, one of the things that helped me was having a family group chat um, that I texted my family on. So I didn't feel like I had to text everybody. Um, I would just, you know, create the family chat and throw in updates here and there. Um, I'd also try to be pretty transparent with my family if I was having a rough week in terms of, you um, lots of exams, lots of quizzes, I'd say, hey, you're not going to hear from me for a week, but I'm doing all right. Um, and then when I could, I'd try to FaceTime them. So that was the best way I could do it. Um, I'm a fan of snail mail. I'd send my sister little cards and things here and there. Um, sometimes they'd do the same to me. So that was what I did. I actually did um, manage to travel uh, quite a bit during PA school. I tried to prioritize um, really just taking advantage of my breaks. We didn't get many. Um, not as much as the med students did, because uh, my my program was condensed to 28 months. Um, but when I did have a week off, um, I would go on a trip or I'd visit my family. Megan asks, what are some spaces to find new recipes or food to try out that might not be triggering when it comes to calorie counts or watching influencers stringently weigh out ingredients? Um, great question. <clears throat> um, I... I, that's a great question. I'm trying to think off the top of my head of websites. Um, if, if disorder and eating patterns are something that, you know, you might, you might struggle with the resource NEDA, N-E-D-A, I can put this in the chat here is a great one. Um, that's a great one that, that has, uh, many links for resources and things like that. Um, you know, I, I encourage you, no matter what, if you're looking for a recipe or a blogger or a food blogger, try to look for one that's a registered dietitian. There are hundreds of them out there, but we as RDs are bound to an ethical code, um, a moral code for our patients, just like medical students, you know, we, we say the oath. Um, we are hold to those same standards as dietitians. So we're, we're going to always give you the best, most balanced balanced approach to nutrition. So that's my biggest recommendation is just no matter what food blogger you go to or what influencer you look to, um, try to make sure that they're a registered dietitian. Um, any suggestions for someone who struggles with water intake? Any tips to promote hydration? Um, 
big fan of straw cups. I don't know what the scientific phenomenon is, but when you put a straw in something, it helps you drink more. Um, I'm a huge fan of ice water. Uh, I don't know if you're on the Stanley cup trend or not, uh, but, but that is my biggest tip is to get a straw cup. Um, for the nurses, I don't know how compliant that is for the floor because it's like technically open. So you might have to have a, a full covered cup. Um, but yeah, it is really tough. Um, you know, the Mio drops, adding flavor, adding water, uh, you know, lemon, lime, fruit, things like that can be helpful. Um, also keeping in mind too, that you can get hydration from foods. So your fruit, things like watermelon, berries, those are going to give you hydration as well. So, um, it's just one of those things that is, uh, you know, just something that's kind of tough, just like meal prepping. There's really not a great answer. You just nothing to it, but to do it type of thing. <laughs> um, all right. Does anybody else have any more questions? Janie, thank you for putting, <clears throat> putting that little note in the chat. Otherwise, I want to thank you again so much for your active participation tonight. It really makes me so happy to see that you're focusing on wellness, you're thinking, asking these questions, and um, hopefully some of the tips I gave you were, were helpful uh, to you in your career. Thank you so much, Caroline. And just one last question in case um, our students were wondering how they can get in touch with you. Yes, most definitely. Um, as I mentioned, I'm active on social media. Um, I'm on TikTok. I'm on uh, Instagram. My handle is at the clinic dietitian. I will put that here just because dietitian is a hard word to spell. It's spelled with a T. <laughs> um, so that's my handle if you'd like to check out. Um, I will say I've got somewhat of a lens toward pediatric nutrition on my uh, account. So not as broad of a, a topic as what we're talking here, but I'm always happy to, to chat. Um, I also have a YouTube channel as well, where I talk about my experiences as a new grad PA, um, kind of my journey from going from a uh, dietitian to PA. I'm going to talk about things like salary transparency, job hunting, job search, things of that nature. So for those of you in the, in the chat tonight who are our pre-PA students that might be of help to you. But um, otherwise, yeah, always happy to, to answer any questions I get. Awesome. I don't see any additional questions in the chat. So just want to thank you so much again, Caroline, and thank you for everyone who attended. I know we're currently standing in your way to a weekend. So thank you so much for joining us and hope you have a good weekend and we hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have a lovely weekend. Take care. Bye, everyone.